Hello, everybody. It's the top of the hour. I uh, will check to see if people are still signing in. Um, looks like we have a few more people joining us today. Um, but we will get started. Uh, hello and welcome to today's forum on Folio SIGs Special Interest Groups. And I'd like to take this first opportunity to thank our panel of subject experts who volunteered to be with us today and share information about their SIGs and the activities happening in their SIGs. So I'm your host today. I'm Sharon Wiles Young, Director of Library Access Services at Lehigh University in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And I'm serving at, currently as the chair of the Folio Product Council. There are a few housekeeping things that I have to get out of the way first. Um, please feel free to use the Twitter feed, hashtag Folio Forum. And we encourage all attendees to use the Q&A box or question and answer box for all your questions. Um, please do not put them in chat. Please put them in the Q&A. That helps us tremendously. This forum will be recorded and is being recorded, and the recording will be available shortly after the session on the openlibraryenvironment.org website. The format, format of today's forum will be each SIG presenter will have about 10 minutes or so to talk about their SIG. And if time allows, between our speakers, we will answer some of the questions in the Q&A box. Otherwise, we'll answer your questions at the end of the session. So to begin, I will start by giving an overview of what are SIGs and the role and responsibility of the product council vis-a-vis -vis the SIG groups. So the Folio uh, Special Interest Groups, or SIGs, are uh, groups of subject matter experts that come from the open source community. What does that mean? That means people from academic libraries, commercial vendors, publishers, anyone with subject interest in the topic who wants to join in can join in to, uh, to the um, to the group. Um, and what I wanted to say is that you could um, join the SIG group by um, going on to wiki.folio.org, and I'll show you that later. But anyway, we want to stress that anyone can join a SIG group. So we, um, what did the SIG groups do in their um, subject, with the subject matter experts? Well, they look at functional needs of a product. Uh, they look at the functional requirements and the priorities of functional requirements. Uh, they discuss and review um, prototypes that are coming out from our designers on the UX, UI, uh, look at priorities in those uh, prototypes, and they discuss functionality and workflows and how that will work. So how do the SIGs uh, form? Um, the Product Council is responsible for forming the SIGs and um, formalizing and giving the charge and goals for each SIG. The Product Council, another name that we refer to is the SIGs of SIGs. So the membership of the Product Council is made up of Olay members um, from each institution of Olay and member representation from Index Data and EBSCO partners. So as the charges are formalized and approved by the Product Council, uh, the SIGs are then formed and uh, the wiki, they get a space on the wiki, the Folio uh, wiki space, and all the tools and documentation will reside there for each SIG group. This is very important um, so that we can work remotely and we're all working together. They also use Zoom for their weekly meetings. The, the Product Council assigns a liaison from each, um, for each SIG group. This is very important um, because 
at our product council weekly meetings, we get an update of what's going on in each SIG. And this will allow the product council to make sure that collaborations are happening, that we can look at what's going on at a higher level and uh, collaborate and facilitate work in that way. Communication is, is so important. Um, and the PC uh, supports the SIGs, and I hope that in the future as our work gets um, more collaborative that we will have the SIGs coming to some of the product council meetings to talk about um, issues or any kind of work that's exciting that needs to be talked about. The PC is also responsible for um, advocacy and outreach on the Folio product. So with that said, I am going to uh, turn this over to Kim Maxwell, uh, who can give more details about the SIGs um, and start off our panel discussion. Give me a moment here and I'll pass it. Oops, sorry. Uh, sorry about that, let me, oops. Are there any questions while I'm passing a oh, ball here? Do you have it, Kim? Yeah. I've got it. Yep, I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. So just so you guys know, all I can see are my slides right now. I can't see anything else. So if you need to tell me something, talk. <laughs> so hi, I'm Kim Maxwell. I'm the e-resources management librarian here at the libraries at MIT. I have been involved with the Folio project um, for just about a year now uh, when I joined a group of resource management experts for a week of meetings in Copenhagen. I know, feel really bad for me. Um, to think about how resource management might work in a new system that actually didn't even have the name Folio yet. Um, it was a completely awesome meeting. It was exhilarating. It was so cool being around so many experts who were so excited about creating this future. And honestly, that, has, that was what attracted me to the project and what's kept me working on it week after week. Um, for me, it's a, it's a really terrific vision and it's staffed by, and here's where my Boston piece will come out, wicked smart and creative people. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Oh, I guess I do need my keyboard, here we go. So what do we do? First of all, I wanna say thank you to um, Kristen Wilson, who I think is on this call, and Kristen Martin, who are the um, co-chairs of our SIG. Um, some of these slides uh, came from, or parts of these slides came from things that they worked up, um, and I was told to crib mercilessly, so I did. So what does our, the original SIG, the resource management SIG, even do? So we work with developers, both software developers and UX developers, to define essential functions for acquiring and managing all types of resources. So think of all the things your current acquisition system does, fund management, orders, claiming, invoices, et cetera. Add in a few things that maybe your ERM does, licensing, access and authentication management, uh, license, I said license already, um, and even some things outside systems might do for you. So reporting types of things and usage statistics and things like that. All of that is part of what the resource management SIG considers its domain. And we work, we also work to figure out how to represent the relationships between resources. Should the relationships be um, at the bib level, holdings, items, entitlements, um, and also the mechanisms and workflows we need to support all of this. It's a lot to think about. We meet on Friday mornings at 8.30 in the morning Eastern time, um, so convert that to your own time zone in your head. But I'm always amazed at how on fire we can be, even on a Friday and even at that hour, which for me is really early. Um, again, we have some really smart, creative, dedicated people working on this. Kim, just excuse yeah. me. It, do you want to put that in presentation mode? We can see. How do you mean? What did I oh. do wrong? Oh, I, okay. I'm, we were just wondering if there the bigger a bigger screen, but that's fine. Um, I, I just did something. I had a question. I had a question about it, but that's that's fine. It could be in okay. any mode. Yeah, I could see. Um, okay, Kim, if you go to the slideshow up at the top. Yeah. 
Because we're seeing your notes. That's just. I don't know why you would be. That's weird. Okay. Sorry, this is the one part we didn't practice, guys. Right now I yeah. have a black screen, so give me a sec. <laughs> so go to end. slideshow up at the top. Yep. And deselect the, the checkbox to use presenter view. There it is. And then. And then click um, from current slide, okay. I guess. Is that better for you guys? Yes, that's nice. Yay. Thank you. Okay, cool. Okay. So I just learned something new. Thanks. A um, couple other things we do. Um, selection. We went back and forth for months about whether or not selection, which we're defining as what happens before you make the decision to buy, was part of our SIG's responsibilities or not. And ultimately we decided we didn't have quite the expertise needed, so we pulled together a separate um, selection task group to look at this, and they are working actually now. Um, we're also very aware of the overlaps between what we consider a resource management world and what other people might consider the world of resource management, like catalogers and metadata folks and people working on access in the technology area. It doesn't really slice out cleanly, so we are constantly evaluating where those lines and overlaps are and bringing in other stakeholders and perspectives as needed. Um, we look at our work through the lens of relationship building and what sorts of interactions are needed between libraries, um, materials vendors, publishers, licensors, subscription agents, consortia, et cetera, in order to successfully manage our resources. And we're always trying to take into consideration a future that we don't actually know about yet. <laughs> so to make sure that the choices that we make don't hinder us in the future, but actually help us. Did I just do that totally on the wrong slide or did I hit the wrong key? There we go. So resource management and folio, a first look. This is what I was alluding to a second ago. Kristen Martin and Kristen Wilson, who are the co-chairs, as I said, of this SIG, presented um, at the folio forum two weeks ago on this very topic. So rather than repeat um, what they said so well, I'm going to point you to a recording of their presentation. Um, the link is up there, and again, you'll be able to see it you know, on your own. Um, but I do want to take a minute to show you what I think is the most exciting and most innovative work that we're doing right now. And that really has to do with um, productivity support. So um, what Kristen and Kristen showed in the forum last week was kind of a prototype of, of where we're going um, with resource management. And it's all designed kind of on an app base. If you've been to any of these before, you know we talk a lot about um, things being little apps that you can pull in to do whatever work your library needs to do. Um, and you can customize it to fit your own needs. Um, and so, to me, that's really where it's at. How can the system better support the productivity in setting up this modular system of apps that you can combine however you want? So three things I want to talk about are workflows and to-do lists, including trouble tickets and email integration. Um, the workflows are something, you know, I think we've all been kind of talking about these for at least a decade at this point. Um, they're workflows that can be triggered automatically or manually set in action. We all want that. Um, and workflows can be adjusted as you go through them to change steps if you need, it, need to. What I like is that we're trying to figure out how to make them shareable so you can create workflows within your own institution and share them with your own colleagues within an institution, but they could also be shared across institutions, meaning libraries. Um, but also with vendors. So there'd be some kind of a store where you could look for and share your workflows. Um, another thing is trouble tickets. So it's part of the to do app. And I'm not going to talk too much about that right now. But within that app of like, here's all the things you have to do, um, there'd be system integration for trouble tickets. So people write in and say, hey, this isn't working the way I should. Help me fix it. Instead of having a whole separate system for that, what we're trying to do is have this integrated so that um, whatever system you might be using, trouble ticketing system, it might actually be part of Folio or talk to Folio, and there would also be CRM integration, customer relationship management integration, so you'd figure out how to get the information about the user in there right up front, um, which would be fantastic. So then you've got the people reporting the problem hooked up with the, with the resource itself that's having the problem, and then you've got the history right there instead of having it in a bunch of different systems that probably don't talk to each other. 
Um, and that's similar for the email integration. So the goal is to bring the emails out of being located solely within your own individual inbox and instead connected with the resources, the people, the platforms that are represented in the system. So you could connect an email directly to a license or with a particular content or with a particular order or all of those things at the same time. At this point, we're still considering the best way to get the data into the system and how to search for just the important stuff once it's in there. So, like I said, work in progress. But the really cool thing to me about these examples of productivity support are, is that they are bringing together information from systems that are currently separate. And mostly I just want to leave you with here some further information and resources. Um, our wiki is listed there. Um, as Sharon mentioned at the beginning, wiki.folio.org. Um, that little display thing is there for everything, and then RM for resource management. If you just do it up to that last slash, you'll get there. Um, the On Discuss, which is a web and email-based forum that we're using for documenting questions and decisions for the project, you can see both the initial sketches done by Philip, um, our UX designer, and a video actually of him uh, discussing the current prototype. And at the bottom, there's a link to the prototype itself. It gives you um, an idea of what the look and feel of the app might be, how things are fitting together. It's still very much a work in progress. Um, it's probably, Philip probably already has a more updated version than the one that's there. That one's probably actually from a couple of weeks ago. So we're, we're moving along pretty quickly. But we are interested in feedback, so let us know what you think. And then there is my information and a little bit more about connecting with Folio on Twitter. And that's what I got. Thank you, Kim. Sure. So I'm going to stop sharing. And grab this. And I'm sorry. Sharon, who am I going to next? Am I going to Peter? Chris, uh, Chris Manley. Chris, there we go. There you go, Chris. Thank you. Over to you. Sure. Okay. Oh, I lost my share screening again. Here we go. Share my desktop. There we go. Let's. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, good morning. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Manley, and I manage the Library Systems Group at the Cornell Library. Um, I've been involved in. Cornell's various explorations of next generation library systems since about 2011. Uh, and I am the convener of the user management SIG. Uh, and our charter from the Product Council is to work with the developers to guide integration of authentication systems such as Shibboleth and authorization systems into the Folio platform. We define privileges associated with the various types of users and incorporate uh, into our discussions issues of privacy of personally identifiable information. Uh, what's implicit there and has been a little more explicit in practice of what our discussions have been around is that we guide the development of the user management app in Folio. And uh, that's the app that manages and stores data about the users of the system. And the way this has played out is a series of discussions around sort of specific aspects of, of that. Uh, the first of those, uh, our sort of first round of, of hashing through stuff at a fairly detailed level, uh, was user metadata, the information that we're tracking about the people in the system, institutional identifiers, names, addresses, and so on. Um, and from there, we did a round of discussions about uh, permissions. Uh, who can view and edit which of those bits of information. And then uh, the developers took each of those in turn and sort of went back and, and built functioning code around uh, what we discussed. Uh, and it was really kind of neat to see that uh, in a fairly short order come to fruition. Uh, and our next round, we, have, uh, are, we are starting to, to look at uh, authentication integration, and eventually we're going to be looking at uh, something that will probably be a fairly big topic, uh, which is user provisioning and the various ways different institutions build our lists of users based on, on institutional systems. Uh, 
uh, either coming from administrative systems or identi identity management systems. Um, now, along the way, uh, we kind of find ourselves asking some pretty fundamental, fundamental questions like, what is a user? Uh, current library systems, uh, certainly Cornell's, uh, we're, we're a Voyager shop, and Voyager has a list of patrons and it has a list of operators, and those are two different worlds. Uh, and in the folio world, there is one list of users, and that includes your librarians. It also includes your patrons, your undergrad, your faculty, your guests. Uh, you know, many institutions have some sort of provisioning for, for guests or friends of the library to have patron access. Um, and so as we were discussing things um, about that, you know, we needed to understand the way those related, especially if a single person plays multiple roles. Uh, for example, a library staff member is also a patron. That touches on the privacy issues. If I'm the system administrator and I need to go into a user's record to edit their permissions in the system, I don't need to see, nor should I see, what books they have checked out. It's really none of my business. Uh, and so we felt it was important to get the design right because the user management module is, I mean, this is not something that is really providing functionality. It is enabling other apps to provide functionality. It's sort of a foundation piece uh, to Folio. Um, and so if we make <laughs> really awkward decisions here or, or ill-informed decisions now, it's going to have ramifications across the other applications later on. Uh, and so we really dug through a lot of the use cases. Uh, we talked through the user metadata in, in uh, extensive detail, going over things field by field and discussing the use cases from each of the institutions represented in the SIG uh, that would impact the requirements. For example, we knew that we would need to track multiple addresses for each patron, but different patron types would have different sorts of addresses. A faculty member would have a home address a mail delivery location, which might be their department office, and then a physical office location, which would be relevant for the institutions that offer service to, of office delivery uh, for faculty. Um, a student, on the other hand, would have their local address, but also a permanent home address. And each of those things, and we talked about, you know, how can we classify these? Do we need, you know, we don't want to have five different address types when half of them are only going to be populated for each half of the, the user base or whatever. Uh, and so it was hashing through things like that and trying to come up with a design that would meet the scope of the needs and the variety of use cases without being just extensively detailed uh, and, and, and uh, exploding out the, the feature set in a way that made it hard to manage. Um, once we had hashed through all of those fields, we looked into permissions and we looked at which data would require which sort of access control. Uh, the developers initially came to us, proposed a fairly simple scheme of access control that sort of stacked permissions at different levels. And I will admit, I was, I was dubious. I was very skeptical. I was pretty sure we were going to need the capability to have a very fine-grained access control scheme, despite my own knowledge that a fine-grained approach makes it harder to manage in the long run. Uh, but after talking through each of those fields and uh, looking at the use cases, we actually, uh, Kim mentioned crossover between different subject areas. We brought in some circulation folks from the resource access SIG in those discussions to talk about um, what we really needed there. We discussed the requirements, we worked through it, and we discovered that the proposed approach was actually going to work with a couple of modifications, and we were even able to simplify it further a bit in a couple of places. Uh, and at the same time, we were able since we were vetting this across multiple institutions, use cases from all over the place, it gave us a pretty high confidence that we weren't designing something that was sort of coding ourselves into a corner that would cut out needed functionality later. Um, and so that's, that's the process we've gone through. Uh, we've just scratched the surface on authentication integration. We decided that we would focus first on shibboleth support and we would look at other options later on. Uh, there is local authentication built in now, uh, so a user can log in with a user ID and password, and that works well for the sort of demonstration and testing that is primarily what's going on right now. Uh, and Index Data is doing some exploration of Shibboleth, and when they're ready, they'll come back to us and we'll discuss 
uh, what the issues are, hash through it, figure out what needs to be done, what the requirements are, and things like that. Uh, the fact that we have that single set of users, um, uh, both patrons and staff together, and that it's a web-based system, uh, has also raised some issues for authentication and access control. For instance, some institutions would like to restrict staff access to certain physical locations. Currently, the students, and this is, the discussion has centered around students who work at CERC desks. Uh, the students who work at our CERC desks uh, can only access the system from the CERC desk because they don't have their own login. Those CERC stations are set up with a, a shared login. And they don't have client software installed on their own computer. So even if they had a login, they wouldn't be able to log in because it requires a, a client software install. Um, but when the client software is a web browser and they're logging in with their university ID, we would need some other way to limit their access uh, to the system so that they're only logging in as a, as a staff person when they're at work. Uh, and we've discussed a few options for that, including just doing IP-based restriction to the system. Uh, and also physical hardware tokens, like a, a multi-factor authentication token that's installed on the CERC station that would allow uh, people to log in. And uh, so those are the sorts of issues we're going to be looking at uh, in the future. I'm working on setting up discussions with uh, Cornell di Cornell's Identity Management Group, uh, starting just with myself, uh, talking to them about how we should be thinking about provisioning users in the system. Um, and our current system is, is based on a batch feed that comes out of our uh, PeopleSoft install, uh, which in turn gets data fed for employees from our Workday system. Uh, and it really doesn't look much different from what we were using 20 years ago with a completely different set of administrative systems and a different library system. But that, that basic sort of batch feed hasn't fundamentally been examined in a very, very long time. And I want to sort of open up the idea of should we be looking at uh, different approaches? Uh, should we be looking at something more that works more on the fly? Is a batch load still the best way to go? Can we do incremental updates? Um, and I want to make sure that we design something that at the very least is aligned with current practice and if possible can even look to the future a little bit uh, because we can't build a 21st century library system if we're still stuck with 20th century workflows and processes. And this is a place where we're definitely not uh, looking particularly current in our, uh, in our existing system. Um, and so I'm looking forward to, to driving that forward in the future. And so I had some bare slides there, but they weren't really helping much. So let me jump to the end here. Thank you. Um, I think uh, I'm more or less at time. So I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'll happily take questions at the end. There's my contact information. Um, and uh, feel free to check out the user management SIG and our meeting notes on the wiki, uh, which is where most of our uh, content is living these days. And with that, I will stop sharing. that and I will pass uh, the magic ball over to Doreen to talk about metadata management. There you go. Thank you, Chris. And hold on. Can everyone see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Doreen Harold, and I manage library technical services at Lehigh University, which is in Pennsylvania in the United States. Um, I'm from an Olay library. So Kuali Olay was the, the predecessor to the development of, or the building of Folio. And um, we're one of three libraries that are using Olay, the open library environment. It's us and the University of Chicago and SOAS, which is um, the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. Um, so we've been involved in Olay since 2008, and we're really excited to be getting involved in Folio as well because there's a lot of great opportunities that are, are coming for that. Um, 
to talk a little bit about the metadata management SIG, or we call it the MM SIG, and I'm the convener of the SIG. Um, you can see on the screen there that this is just a, a description of what our mission is for metadata management. Um, define essential bibliographic meta or management functions, um, defining data elements for bibliographic control, exploring various formats and schema, considering metadata storage and harmonization between systems, um, suggesting requirements for holdings and items, and defining core authority functions. So. Since we've started meeting, these are some of the things that we've been talking about and some of the things that we're planning to talk about in the future. And we had first met in um, December 21st uh, in 2016, so we haven't been around as long as some of the other SIGs. And we haven't been meeting regularly since then. Um, we are expecting that when the development for metadata management really gears up. It's in the very early stages, but as it gears up, we're expecting that we're going to be meeting a lot more frequently, especially um, to provide us with an opportunity to engage with the developers and giving them feedback and, and having them then go back to the drawing board and having a lot of back and forth as they develop functionalities. Um, Though there hasn't been a lot of active development yet for metadata management, our meetings have been opportunities that we've had to engage with representatives from libraries and also with representatives from index data and KINT and EBSCO as we try to think about how metadata functionality will be developed. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So right now we currently have about 10 to 18 participants at each meeting. And um, as Sharon had mentioned earlier, our doors are always open. We would love to have more people join us. So if you're interested, please get in touch with us. We'd love to have you join us. We've, we have formal participants, and we've even had people come in who aren't formal um, members of the SIG just to sit in and listen and provide some, some feedback as well. And we really appreciate getting feedback from others. Um, so our, our, as the other SIGs do, our membership includes time zones throughout Europe and the United States, and we would, again, like to encourage others to join us, too. So we have no problem with um, fitting more people in. But in the meetings that we've had so far, some of the topics we've discussed include um, a session where we reviewed the, the user experience and user interface and the functional matrix. The functional matrix is something that had been worked on um, during the summer of 2016, there are representatives from every functional area um, and from different libraries um, working with people from index data to try to get a sense of what are the basic needs of libraries, you know, what, what's going to be a system that could be a, a, a good replacement and then build additional functionality on that in the future. Um, so we got to look at what that team, the functional matrix team, had had completed during that time. Then we also had a demo of the Folio prototype, and that had been alluded to earlier. I just also wanted to provide a, a direct link to that. You can see that at the bottom, um, or right underneath the, the demo of the Folio prototype bullet point. Um, we also took a look at the knowledge base and metadata document, which um, was built by Mark Johnson of KINT, and again, there's a link to that there. Um, we did a review of the Folio metadata management functionality, Mark, for the initial release of Folio. So that was a, a smaller team of our SIG who had met with um, Harry from EBSCO to look at what the basic functionality is going to be, at least the first release of functionality. And then, We've had a lot of discussion about item statuses and workflows. Um, this is one of those areas that we're trying to, you know, really make this a different system than what our existing ILSs are. Um, you know, we, we collected everybody's ideas about what item statuses are and how we utilize them and are also trying to expand our thinking into workflows. Um, what 
uh, Kim had referred to before is productivity support and workflows and how to handle things as they move from point A to point Z to complete a process. And uh, especially, you know, as a process moves, making sure that the right people are, are pinged to take part where they're supposed to take part in the process. And we're really excited about that, you know, some issues that we've struggled with, you know, for example, um, you might be getting loads of records that um, come in for EBA or, or PDA uh, collections. At Lehigh, for example, we, we get um, many records for our um, ebooks that we want to provide to our users. And if we had a workflow tool that could help us, again, from point of acquisition to cataloging to uh, movement into our, our um, search functionality for users, uh, metadata, uh, a workflow tool would really be helpful for us to make sure that the process is complete and then when exceptions come in too, to be able to move communications to complete step A and B and C and D. Um, we're really excited about that ability with the workflow application. And then we also took a look at the review, we reviewed the metadata model, which again, there's a link there at the bottom. Um, so this has been a really, you know, trying to expand our minds kind of period of thinking about outside of the box of the ILS that we've been using. And um, so we would like to have you join us, as was alluded to before, if you go to the, the wikifolio.org website, you can see the minutes from our SIG. And we're looking forward to, to, to doing some cross work with the other SIGs because as the item statuses and workflows is one example, is a place where we need to figure out how information is going to flow from one functional area to another. And so that's in our future as well to be discussing with them. So I'm now going to move the ball on to Deb. All right, I think I got it. Thank you, Doreen. Sure. Here we go. Okay, hi. I'm Deb Lamb. I'm the Assistant Director for Access and Administrative Services at Cornell's Hospitality, Labor, and Management Library, which is another way that we make things more complicated sometimes because we have lots of names. I'm also a member of the Resource Access SIG. Uh, Andrea Loingman from Duke is our convener, but she had a conflict, so I volunteered to present today. This slide shows you our charge, and it's pretty all-encompassing. And it goes from basic circulation functions to our interrelationships with other departments, our institution, other libraries, interlibrary loan groups, consortia, and other commercial entities. And in this project, interrelationships is really a key concept. This slide kind of shows you our aspirations. I think Kim called them productivity support. Um, there's more or less informal goals, um, and any of these aspirations would really be an improvement over what we have, and the thought that we might have them all is amazing. Um, everything should be configurable, and we should not have to create a new loan policy every time we have a new material type or an item type. But the communication piece for me is critical, and listening to others talk before me, um, it just opens my eyes to how much we need this, where we can see everything that we need about a patron or an item in one place and not have to go in and out of modules just to find basic information. I think that's going to be very beneficial to both our staff and our patrons. One thing, though, that's really important to me is to be in on this from the very beginning. I've gone through implementation of a few ILSs over the years, and it always felt like circulation was kind of an add-on, an afterthought. It's like we'd create this beautiful bibliographic database, and, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, well, then we got to create CERC. So to be in on the beginning of the creation of a CERC app is really a unique experience. And I think we have an opportunity to just not build a system, but to create and control our future. And so how does this magic happen? 
Well, we've, we've been meeting regularly about one to two times a week with Philip Jacobson, the UX specialist with image data, to work through some CERC components, some of which you can see on this slide. Any of you who've worked in access services can see that this list can take many, many meetings to discuss. We all do things slightly differently at our institutions, and sometimes it's because of local policies, and sometimes it's because of the system we have. One thing we really need to remember is to just not think in terms of what we currently do and what our systems do, but what it is we want to do and what we want the systems to do. Andre has been very good about reminding us this and lifting us out of the trees so we can see the forest. Item status, I'm glad to hear uh, Doreen say that the metadata management is talking about item status. Uh, for us, this is an example of a CERT component that's been taken deeper. We all deal with item statuses in some way and not just CERC. There's crossovers like on order or in process. And this is our examples where the communication piece would really pay off. Again, we'd be able to see the same information about an item in one place. And we think we understand what item statuses are and what they do, but it's a legitimate question to ask, what is an item status when you get right down to it? So when we're having these kind of ongoing discussions, Philip listens patiently, asks questions for clarification, and then translates our discussion into a whiteboard form like this. And I'm going to pause now and just say how blown away I am that Philip or anybody can do this. It's a great visual representation of the discussion. I don't think this way, so I'm always impressed when somebody does. So this is a result of one of those kind of conversations. It's on loan rules. It's very simple. It's very elegant, and it's extremely functional. And it has four components rather than the usual three. Currently, we're discussing how these loan rules operate and what would take precedent in what situation. Again, the group I'm working with is very smart, very collegial, very spirited, have very strong ideas, but are open to listening. And together, I think we've gotten a very good group um, to contribute to this. We've also started to work with Kate Marima from EBSCO on loan policy metadata. This is an example of the spreadsheet that we're working on. At one of our most recent meetings, we spent working through the functionality needed for fixed due dates. Not everybody uses them, but it was really very um, enlightening to talk about it and how the system would act and how we would want the system to act. So what's in it for you? And why would you volunteer your time to work with us? One thing these discussions has highlighted for me is that our current systems were created in a book-centric McBee card world that was once adequate and no longer is. And I will tell you, that is my personal McBee card punch that I still hold on to. I've been around that long. This is our reality now, a plethora of material types and loan types, and we all cram them into a system, and most of our workflows are really workarounds. Working on the SIG has given us all the ability to stand back and think about what could be and not just what our current limitations are. I've benefited by being a part of the SIG, and I think my institution will benefit as well when it comes time for our implementation. In fact, I like this experience so much, I volunteered for another SIG, the Privacy SIG, which just operated, started yesterday. So thank you for listening. Uh, the Resource Access SIG contact is Andrea Loingman for Duke. This is her information. And we do hope that you'll join us very soon. And now I'm going to give you to Lydia. Nope, didn't get there. Lydia, I 
There we go. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you, Lydia. Good. I'm Lydia Pettis from Cornell University's Library Systems Office. The reporting SIG is new enough that no one has yet handed me the official folio PowerPoint theme setup. So we're going to be a little bit of bare bones here. We had our first meeting last week. We're just firing up. We meet Monday mornings from 9 to 10 uh, Eastern time. We have 13 folks from a number of different institutions that have raised their hand to volunteer and register. And of course, we would welcome any other people from any other institution. We have a charge that spans a number of areas. First, identifying the reporting requirements in each functional area. I've been writing reports for 20 years, so I still think of the functional areas as accounting acquisition, circulation, and cataloging. As the system is developed, uh, it's in our purview to make sure that what the developers create has an appropriate data structure to support our existing and anticipated reporting needs. Uh, there's an interest in looking at all the different types of reports the prepackaged reports, the ones that run automatically, the requests we get in on a daily basis, and so on. We'll be evaluating the output and the format of various reports. Are they coming out in spreadsheets or printed reports or PDFs or on the web, on paper, or what is it? What is it people are doing? And then Part of our charge is to review and evaluate third-party and open source reporting tools. Now, as I said, we're very new to this. So in our first meeting, essentially what we did was introduce ourselves and begin to clarify what it is that index data and the developers need from us in order to do their work. Uh, here are two contact people at Cornell that if you have questions about this, uh, feel free to send us an email. And that's the end of what I have. Uh oh. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, just Stop thank sharing. you. Right. Thank sure. you, Liz. I thought I lost it all for a minute. So I think I now drag the ball down to Peter. Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. And hello, my name is uh, Peter Murray. I'm the open source community advocate at Index Data. And on the Folio project, uh, try to uh, help keep the uh, pieces running smoothly. Uh, I have a, kind of a uh, batting cleanup role uh, here uh, at the, uh, towards the end of the presentation. Uh, I'll be talking about the consortia SIG uh, the internationalization SIG, uh, also the privacy SIG, uh, which met for the first time uh, earlier this week. Uh, and also, now that uh, you've seen the activity of the SIGs, uh, a little bit of uh, how the SIGs fit into the development picture. Uh, so let's uh, start first uh, with the, the SIGs. 
the uh, consortia SIG is convened by Harry Kaplanian uh, from uh, EBSCO. He could not make it to the presentation today, so he asked me to fill in. Uh, the consortia, uh, kind of the full name of this SIG is uh, Consortia and Intercampus Services. So uh, spanning uh, things that happen between institutions. Uh, we've met twice now as a, uh, as a group, uh, so we are relatively young. Uh, and in the first couple of meetings, uh, we have looked at uh, what patterns uh, exist in, in uh, consortial architectures. Uh, how are resources shared? How do consortia uh, arrange themselves? Uh, and questions like that. Uh, I believe we have four consortia represented uh, in the active SIG membership right now. Uh, and as everyone has uh, uh, said all along, uh, more are welcome. Uh, and so we're exploring the details of how at least these four consortia and, and other examples that we know about uh, fit into these uh, structures about uh, how resources are shared. Uh, and we also are, are talking a bit about how we would like things to operate uh, in the future. Uh, one of the design elements of Folio is uh, to make it easier to share knowledge base data and bibliographic uh, data and, uh, and so how would our, how, how do we want Folio to operate uh, in, in those environments uh, in consortia and interinstitutional services? Uh, another SIG uh, is the internationalization SIG. Uh, this SIG met earlier this year for a number of meetings. Uh, and has gone on hiatus uh, temporarily. Uh, I'm the convener of this SIG, and so if you have any uh, questions regarding uh, the internationalization SIG, uh, get in touch with me. Uh, internationalization is a, is a fascinating uh, area. Uh, what do we need to do to make the software work in different locations around the world? Uh, and that includes uh, some things that you might expect, uh, such as uh, labels for fields uh, need to be translated, error messages need to be translated, uh, we need to handle different date formats uh, and, and different monetary formats. Uh, it also extends to other areas. Uh, what is the impact when we have uh, right-to-left display of text uh, in, a, uh, in a, a system uh, in addition to uh, left-to-right text, which uh, most, of, most of us on this call are probably familiar with. Uh, what happens when we want uh, the labels for uh, uh, some of our fields to be uh, translated, uh, or actually some of the values for some of the fields to be translated. Uh, we're one of the representatives on the internationalization SIG uh, is from Saudi Arabia, uh, and he was showing uh, examples of software that they've made uh, international uh, or applied uh, uh, different localizations to. Uh, and some of the problems that they run into is if you've got uh, a table in your system for the names of your branch libraries, uh, but that table can't be translated into other languages, uh, you have to pick uh, which language those values are going to be uh, input in. And uh, when you switch the display from one language to another, 
uh, those values aren't translated. Uh, and uh, that can be a, a hindrance to uh, people using the system. Uh, so to this point, the internationalization SIG has uh, gone through a list of requirements uh, that uh, we would like to see in the first release of the software, uh, kind of done a, a two-level uh, prioritization of requirements, uh, those things that uh, need to be in the first version and those things uh, that we can wait for uh, development in future versions. Uh, and so that uh, input has been done. Uh, and so, like I said, this uh, special interest group is, is on hiatus uh, until uh, we find uh, more things that need to be discussed uh, or we get feedback from the developers uh, asking questions uh, and so forth. You can go to the uh, wiki page. Uh, the URL is here uh, and read the minutes of, uh, of our meeting. Uh, uh, a, a bit of trivia, uh, you'll see the, the tag at the end is uh, the letter I, 18, and then the letter N. Uh, this is an interesting convention in software development to uh, stand for internationalization, uh, and the reason it is I, 18N is because there are 18 letters in internationalization between the I at the beginning and the N at the end. Uh, and so that was the, the most uh, common way uh, that it's been abbreviated, uh, I-18N. The last SIG I want to cover is the privacy SIG. Uh, this one, uh, in addition to the reporting SIG, also just started this week. Uh, we just had our first meeting where those that uh, were participating uh, introduced themselves uh, and talked about uh, the, uh, the role of, of privacy uh, in uh, library systems uh, and started to review the, uh, the functionality of, uh, of the um, uh, spreadsheet uh, uh, for the release one uh, version. Uh, these Last four SIGs, uh, reporting, consortia, uh, internationalization, and privacy um, are interesting in that they're cross-functional in nature. The, the first four uh, SIGs, uh, metadata management, resource access, resource management, and user management, uh, all focus on particular functionality in the system. Uh, these latter four uh, look at functionality or look at needs across all functions of the system. So we need reporting everywhere. Uh, there's consortia and inter-institutional uh, services needed everywhere. Internationalization is needed everywhere uh, and privacy is needed everywhere. Uh, we think that there's one more SIG uh, that we need to form uh, surrounding accessibility. Uh, and again, that's a, a cross-functional area, something that will uh, guide uh, the development of uh, accessibility across uh, the system. I want to shift gears here at the end of the present. Oh, I'm sorry, before that. Uh, so all of these SIGs have their own meeting times. Uh, they tend to be clustered. Uh, in the early morning hours uh, in, uh, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, primarily because we've got a lot of participants in Europe uh, that are, are participating in these SIGs, so uh, everyone is, is making a bit of a compromise uh, to participate uh, in these SIGs. We have started recording the SIG meetings and uh, publishing those recordings as well. Uh, and so if you miss a SIG meeting because of a conflict or because the time uh, isn't convenient for you, uh, you can catch up uh, with what's happening uh, with that SIG uh, by first viewing the minutes and then for more in-depth uh, uh, watching uh, the recording. Uh, this calendar is on the wiki. Uh, it's a uh, link. Uh, 
off the uh, the first page under the the uh, list of important links, uh, and the URL is here as well. Uh, these times are displayed in Eastern U.S. time. Uh, when you sign into the wiki, you can edit your settings uh, to change that time zone uh, to be your local time zone so that uh, these meeting times will match. Uh, shifting gears now, you, if you've been a, a part of uh, Folio Forum uh, audiences before, you might have seen uh, this uh, set of diagrams around user-centered design uh, and with the focus on the bottom one uh, that we have uh, strategy informing uh, user experience design which is informing development, development informing user experience design uh, which is informing strategy. Um, this is a, a great diagram as far as it goes, but we get questions about how these groups interact with each other. Uh, and so I wanted to uh, offer a, a, a more uh, dense diagram that uh, explores that question. So here are these uh, same groups of people, library strategists, uh, the special interest groups, and uh, the software developers. Uh, you've heard uh, the representatives from the SIGs talk about uh, the things that are, are being developed uh, to offer to the software developers. Uh, those come in the form of the prototype, uh, which Philip has been uh, uh, working on, our, our user experience design lead. Uh, and also the functional spreadsheet. So the combination of these two items, uh, the prototype, how things are supposed to look, and the functional spreadsheet describing how things are supposed to work, uh, become input to the software developers. Um, straddling the special interest group uh, membership and the software developers are two groups of, of people. One is, is the product owners, uh, and the second is the system uh, analysts. Uh, those that have been involved in the SIG so far, you'll know the, the product owner as Kate uh, from EBSCO, uh, she's filling that role, uh, and the system analyst at this point uh, is Charlotte uh, from Index Data. I put owner in double quotes uh, because it has a particular meaning uh, in the agile methodology for development that we're using, that the product owner doesn't mean that this person gets to decide everything that's going to happen. The, the, the product owner is the person that is, again, in the language of agile, uh, is taking the input requirements, or taking the, the requirements as input and creating user stories and tasks surrounding uh, those user stories. Uh, and that becomes the activities that the software developers are, are working on. So if you hear us refer to the product owner, um, know that that is a, a specialized role that's taking the prototype and the functional spreadsheet and turning that into actionable items uh, for the software developers. Uh, the special interest groups are also reporting weekly uh, to, the, uh, to the product council, uh, and uh, the product council has liaisons to the special interest groups, uh, and that's a form of coordination uh, to make sure that uh, everybody is working towards the same goal. So those are the things that, that the special interest groups are, are putting out. Of course, the software developers and the library strategists have their own things that they're putting out. Uh, the software developers, as they work in agile sprints, uh, put out sprint reviews. And uh, these are uh, uh, demonstrations of everything that's been developed uh, in the past four weeks. Uh, and uh, so that you can see uh, the progress of how the activities described in the prototype and the functional spreadsheet are actually coming to life. Um, 
we'll also soon be putting up a, a demo site uh, where uh, uh, people can generally uh, interact with the system and see how it's coming to life. Uh, we have uh, a couple of demo systems that we use internally right now with the developers uh, that they're, they're, they're developing against, uh, but they aren't public demo sites yet, and, and we intend to soon put up a public demo site. Uh, so those demo, that, those sprint reviews uh, are feedback to the special interest groups that become part of the cycle of working on the prototype and the functional spreadsheet. Uh, they're also input uh, to the library strategists uh, to know the general pace of the project and how it's moving along. Uh, the library strategists are, of course, providing uh, developer resources uh, to uh, adjust the pool of people working uh, as software developers. Uh, there's one final aspect uh, to this SIG process, uh, and that is how new SIGs are formed. Uh, and new SIGs can, uh, new ideas for new SIGs can come from anybody in, uh, in the community. Uh, can propose a, a SIG charter, uh, uh, have a, a birds of a feather meeting uh, to work on uh, that charter for the SIG. Uh, and propose it to the, uh, to the product council. Uh, the product council then has a role to uh, make sure there's awareness across all of the SIGs uh, that this new SIG has been proposed and to uh, uh, address any overlaps uh, in, in um, uh, areas uh, in the charter. Uh, the, uh, the product council and the other library strategists uh, then seek out uh, new participants for the SIG, uh, and, and that SIG is formed, a convener is identified, uh, and this whole process begins anew. Uh, so this is a, a, a very participatory uh, process, uh, as uh, I think all of the, uh, the representatives of the SIG, SIGs have described, uh, it's, it's tends to be very open, uh, and when you tend to do things open, it tends to be very messy. Uh, this is the ideal uh, uh, for the interaction uh, that we're driving towards, but uh, as the ideal that we're driving towards is uh, uh, subject uh, to the reality on the ground and, and making this process uh, really work uh, most efficiently and most effectively for everybody involved. So I think I will end there and stop sharing. Uh, if I need to pass the ball to somebody, let me know. Otherwise, I think we are open to questions now. Uh, um, Peter, uh, would you um, share it with me? And I'll, I'll just um, share my desktop of the wiki so um, people can see what our wiki looks like. Very good, there you go. All right. Okay, let's see how my screen is not sharing. What's going on? Here we go. Um, so I just wanted, before I uh, start uh, with the questions, I just wanted to show everybody um, how we were all referring to the wiki.folio.org here. So you can see, um, what's happening uh, at, on all the teams. They're all here, the special interest groups. We have the product council here. So you can go in, look at members, look uh, at, we mentioned conveners. Those are the people who are leading each SIG group. You can find out all that information, plus our minutes, our agendas are all here. Um, so I think that's a really powerful tool um, for you to see what's happening and if you want to get involved also. Um, very helpful information. So we do have a question. Um, one of the questions, let's start with, that I saw first has been, um, has a, has resource sharing interlibrary loan been placed into a SIG at this point? And I think that would be me. Uh, 
for resource access that is part of our charge and we haven't gotten to it yet because we're still going through the CERC components, but that's something that we will talk about. So join us. Great. Yep, and that's under resource access there. So if you want to get involved. Let's see, any other questions people have? I think we answered some of them verbally. There were just some questions about presenters' um, notes and stuff. Um, any other questions people have? Anything we didn't address? Okay. All right, since I don't see any more coming in, I'm going to wrap up our session. Uh, thank you so much to our presenters for their overviews. I think it really helped uh, let us all know what's going on and Peter's overview so slide was very good to tell how all the um, information flows around our project. Um, and thank you to all the attendees and for your questions. Our next forum will be on May 17th with Andrew Nagy, who will talk about um, folio, the EBSCO Folio Innovation Challenge Grant, um, which was announced and I noticed it on the Code for Lib uh, uh, listserv yesterday. So don't forget to, you can join in into our SIGs, uh, come to the wiki and look at our SIGs and the recording for today will be at openlibraryenvironment.org. Thank you everybody for your attention and for attending. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, yep. Bye everybody. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Wonderful presentation.